Good morning, all. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, we're going to be talking about proactively managing your unfunded accrued liability so that your agency can understand how to increase your plan's funded status, lower future payment amounts, and decrease your agency's unfunded accrued liability, your UAL. While every agency's budget and financial situation is unique, what we're going to present today are strategies that every agency should carefully consider as you develop your budget and plan for the future. Here are your presenters today. Folks, one of these things is not like the others. Uh, I'm David Takearts, your stakeholder strategy manager and lumberjack, according to this picture. Uh, I'm joined today by three of our top pension actuaries who will get into the meat of our topic, Julian Robinson, Kurt Schneider, and Randy Zubek. Also, a little bit of housekeeping here before we dive into it. Number one, the slides that you're going to be seeing will be made available after the webinar. I will email that out to everybody who registered, so no need to ask for those. I'll get those sent out. And secondly, the webinar is being recorded, uh, so we'll get that done as soon as possible, probably be a couple of days to make sure that the sound editing and quality is there. And then we'll also distribute that out to everybody who registered and we'll also make it available on the CalPERS website uh, for anybody who wasn't able to attend. And we'll have that there for a good long time because the information that we're sharing today is really not something that's gonna go um, out of phase. This information is gonna be valuable for any and all folks um, amongst our employer community who have an interest in looking for ways to mitigate uh, the rising costs of their employer contributions. Lastly, um, we do have um, a, an avenue for you to ask questions during the webinar. There are many hundreds of folks on this line, so it wouldn't be uh, economical to have everybody be able to um, verbally chime in. So what we're asking you to do is to type in your questions in the chat function. We do have folks in the room here who will see and corral those questions. And then at the end of the call, we're careful to leave room to address some of the uh, most common questions, uh, the most piercing questions. We'll make sure that we um, answer all of those. And if we don't get a chance to answer your question, uh, then we'll be sure to respond to you uh, offline as well. Okay. Today's topics for discussion. Uh, we're going to start off with a brief discussion of the state of the CalPERS system, including the overall financial status of the fund, uh, the steps that we've taken to reduce risk overall and protect the fund. Um, then our actuary team will briefly explain more about pension fundamentals, including how contributions are determined, how liabilities accrue, and how amortization works. Once we level set there, uh, we'll, we'll really get into the heart of it, which is a discussion of how to manage your unfunded accrued liability or UAL uh, proactively. So how to make your payments count more uh, by looking at the required contributions and determining how you can save your agency significant interest in the future. Um, and our team will also go through some different methods and strategies to give you the best bang for your buck. Then we'll help you get launched with some immediate steps that you can take to make this happen. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll open up the, the uh, webinar for questions at that time and field those ones that you send in through the chat box. So feel free to send in those questions as we go through, or you can wait to the very end. Dealer's choice. Okay, quick note here about CalPERS. Our mission is to deliver retirement and health care benefits to members and their beneficiaries. CalPERS is the, is the largest and by far the most complex pension system in America. Um, we are roughly split between public agency members, which includes cities, counties, special districts, uh, state agencies, and school members who actually make up the largest proportion. So while Cal Sturz handles the uh, certificated teacher side of the equation, everyone who's not certificated who works in school districts uh, is eligible for CalPERS membership, and that's actually the bulk of the membership. Uh, this leads to a level of complexity that requires a shared vision, a shared responsibility for success, and we'd like to thank you for your commitment towards this shared mission. Let's take a look at some of the recent facts and figures. So last year, CalPERS paid out $21.4 billion in pension benefits. Um, these benefits also come back to your communities in, in less direct ways, so we had $20.9 billion in economic activity generated from these payments. Uh, on the investment side, CalPERS invested $27.3 billion directly into the California economy, uh, creating both jobs and opportunities in the public and private sector. 
Currently, the fund, the total amount of assets that we have under control is valued at about $350 billion. This literally shifts several billion dollars a day, depending on the state of the financial markets. Uh, last year, our most recent fiscal year return, you can see, was 11.2%. This exceeded our discount rate, uh, which is that assumed rate of return, which we use to calibrate the overall performance of the fund, including employer contributions. So we were pleased that we were able to exceed our mark there. And even more recently, our calendar year return, the, the true January to December return, was at 15.73. So that's positive because it does have an impact on the year-to-year year to year projections for employer contributions. Uh, of course, however, CalPERS is a long-term horizon investor, so what really matters is how we do over the long term. Uh, we really look out towards a 30-year time span. That's really our advantage in the complicated investment market. The funded status is really the barometer for the financial health of the entire system. So this is the combined assets to liability ratio for all of the 3,000 employers uh, that are part of the system. If we combine those and look at the percentage of amount of money that we have on hand versus what we project to have to pay out in the future, uh, you can see that we are currently, or the most current one that we have is 71%. Uh, this is up from 68.3%. Uh, the year before, so we are on an upward track here. Our goal, of course, is to be 100% funded, uh, but in practical terms, really an 80 to 90% funded ratio is a good short-term goal, and that's where CalPERS is pointed. 50% um, would be what we would call the red zone, uh, very dangerous for the overall health of the system, and so we're very focused on driving this number as high as possible. Now let's look at some recent policy decisions uh, that have strengthened the fund. Looking from left to right here, many of you know that um, over the course of the last, say, 18 months or so, there's been a lot of discussions around CalPERS discount rate, which is, again, that assumed rate of return. What is the expected rate of return that we think we'll get on our investments? That has been lowered from 7.5 in a three-step phase-in to 7%. So that has significantly strengthened the fund overall. Um, this also coincides with a new asset allocation, meaning the percentage of our investments that are in different asset classes. This is the purview of the CalPERS board, is to be able to take a look at our investments and allocate them amongst uh, various asset classes in a way that we think will deliver the long-term returns that we need to fund the system for current and future generations. And then third and lastly, and most recently, we've shortened the amortization period. Important to note here that this amortization shortening uh, is prospective only. Okay, so this was not a squeeze on past liabilities. This is on a going forward basis. Um, the cost for pension debts will be calculated on a 20 year rate instead of 30. Um, all three of these things in combination have significantly strengthened the fund and put CalPERS and the whole system on a path to sustainability. But make no mistake, I think a lot of the employers in this call will agree that especially the discount rate and the shorter amortization has put additional stress on employers. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about here today are ways that you can work with CalPERS, um, work amongst yourself, work um, with your teams to look at your budgets and figure out what can we do uh, to keep the cost as low as they can, knowing that overall the costs are projected to rise over coming years. So that's the point of our webinar today. To guide us in that discussion, I'd like to turn uh, the talk over now to our actuarial team. Good morning. This is Julian Robinson. I'm a senior pension actuary in CalPERS Actuarial Office. Good morning, I'm Kurt Schneider, also a senior pension actuary with CalPERS Actuarial Office. Before we jump into a discussion about ma managing your unfunded accrued liability, we're gonna cover a few basics um, on how CalPERS determines your employer contributions and some pension fundamentals. First of all, in order to determine your uh, pension contributions, we perform an annual valuation every year. And to start, start this process off, we, ca we, we capture all the employee and membership information of all the people covered in your plan. In addition to that, 
we look at the benefit structure that your plan has, the various formulas, whether it's miscellaneous or whether it's safety. On top of that, we add actual assumptions and methods in order to project what your benefits are, are going to be and the costs and to determine, help determine what the accrued liability is. We also add the actual experience of your plan and together all those four things are used in calculating your annual contribution. The contribution is comprised of two components. The first component is a normal cost component, which is expressed as a percentage of payroll. And that's the value of benefits which are accruing in the current year for your active members. The second component of the employer contribution cost is a payment to amortize the unfunded accrued liability, if your plan has an unfunded accrued liability. And nowadays, as we heard in the introduction, most plans are making additional payments to amortize their unfunded accrued liability. Today's webinar is mostly focused on that component of the pension contribution, how to handle the unfunded accrued liability amortization. The normal cost, as we just mentioned, is the value of benefits which accrue for active people in one year. We look at the benefit levels, we use the assumptions which are reviewed regularly to make sure they're up to date, and our funding method, which we use the NCH normal method, to determine what your normal cost is each year. The accumulation of all past normal costs is the accrued liability. So that represents the value of benefits accrued for all the members in the plan, both all including the current active members in the plan, those members which are terminated, and also the retirees. Julian, you're saying that the normal cost is the benefit that's being earned in the current year, and the accrued liability is all the normal costs from prior years. Does the actuary also calculate the normal cost for the active members for all the future years? Yes, we actually do calculate that as part of our evaluation process. However, the requirements to pay for future benefits is done on an annual basis. So we charge you a normal cost each year as each year's service accrues. So putting some of the pieces together, we look at the accrued liability, which we've just calculated, and we compare it to the assets which have um, accumulated in the plan. If the accrued liability exceeds the assets, then we have an unfunded accrued liability. In some cases, we have a few plans in the system where the assets actually are, uh, are greater than the accrued liability, so a few plans in the system are in surplus, so they do not have an unfunded accrued liability. So just a, a final summary, the contributions which are paid each year to, to, towards the plan, the normal cost, which is shared between the employer and then the employee, and then an additional do, um, a payment towards the amortization of the unfunded accrued liability, which is expressed as a dollar amount. If you look in your valuation report, you can see the results of the calculations that Julian just explained. In this exhibit here, we're showing the funded status of the plan. The first item there, the present value of projected benefits equals the value of all the benefits for all your current and former employees, past, present, and future. And like Julian said, the future benefits that haven't been earned yet, we're not collecting contributions for yet, so don't worry too much about that first item. The second item there, that's the entry age accrued liability, all the prior normal cost, the value of everything that's been earned to date for your, all your members, active and retired. The third item there, that's the market value of assets. And then we take the difference between those two, like Julian said, to get the unfunded accrued liability on line four. And that's the amount that we're gonna have to collect from the employer in order to be able to pay the benefits. And you can see in that right-hand column in this example, it's $79 million that's still owed in the unfunded liability. And line five there is the funded ratio. We simply take the uh, assets and divide them by the liability. And this gives you an idea on a relative basis how well funded the plan is. Now, we're not gonna collect the entire $79 million unfunded liability in one chunk. Like Julian said, we're collecting an amortization payment towards the unfunded liability. You can see the required contribution here, which is from page four of the report, where we show the normal cost rate, that's the percent of pay that's paying uh, the service that the active members are currently earning towards their benefit, which is collected over their entire career, and 
supposedly completely funded at the time they retire. And then we also break out the amortization piece towards the unfunded liability. We have two ways to pay it. In this case, you can pay $522,000 per month for 12 months over the fiscal year, or you can pay everything all at once in July, which in this case is $6 million. And you might notice that the $6 million is less than 12 times the 522,000. And what's happening there is that if you pay all those 12 payments in advance, you save a little bit of interest, about a half years of interest. So that's one way you can save money. But I wanna point out that in either case, whether you're making 12 monthly payments or one single lump sum, you're making the minimum required contribution towards um, the unfunded liability. So in order to collect all that $79 million, there's a bunch more payments in the future. So what does the future hold? Well, with our amortization schedule, and this is an example from an actual valuation, if we play it all the way out in the future and see how is that $79 billion being collected, you can see that in this case, and it's very common for a lot of agencies right now, you see very steep increases in the early years as the most recent amortization layers are phased in and followed by steep decreases, steep decreases later on as the oldest layers are fully amortized and drop off. But what we're gonna talk about today is that's not the only way you can pay off your unfunded liability. We afford agencies a lot of flexibility in exactly how they wanna pay it off. For example, on this right-hand slide, I'm showing you those same contributions if the employer makes ADPs. Now, this might not be an acronym that you're familiar with. We had it on an earlier slide. What that stands for is additional discretionary payments. And what that means is we allow agencies to make payments in addition to their minimum required contribution. They can pay any amount they want at any time they want. It's totally at their discretion. So that's what an ADP is. We're gonna talk about this much more later on, but I just wanna say that the payment pattern on the right and the payment pattern on the left both pay off the same unfunded liability. And I also wanna take a minute to point out that on these slides and on the future slides in this presentation, we're talking about paying off the current unfunded liability, the current amortization basis. Every year in the future, we're gonna do another valuation. We're gonna have gains, we're gonna have losses. Those are gonna create new amortization layers and none of those are included on these slides, either the left or the right. Let's start discussing proactively managing your unfunded accrued liability. The required contribution is the minimum payment as Kurt just stated. The unfunded accrued liability is essentially a long-term debt, which is owed to CalPERS. The interest rate we charge on that debt is the discount rate. And as you know, that's currently phasing down to a 7% level. When we look at paying down debt, it's a basic financial, financial principle to pay down your most expensive or most costly debt first. The Government Finance Officers Association has issued some you know, guidance and advises agencies to develop a funding policy, which is to help them systematically and in a disciplined manner deal with the pay down the active service and the, the contributions over the lifetimes of the employees benefiting from, from, their, from these benefits. This promotes inter, intergenerational equity. So the options that we're gonna talk about today are these three. Number one, making ad hoc additional contributions, ADPs, additional dis discretionary payments. The second method we're gonna talk about are called fresh starts. And the last method we're gonna talk about is a brief discussion on IRS section 115 trusts. All of these are three ways in which you can proactively manage your unfunded accrued liability. Let's talk a bit more about ADPs. The idea is, by making additional contributions above the minimum to your pension plan now, you can save money down the road by re reducing the interest owed on the outstanding balance. A good example of, of an ADP is one made by our state of California. In 2017, Senate Bill 84 directed the state to pay an additional $6 billion 
in the fiscal year 1718 towards the unfunded accrued liability. It had two effects. The immediate effect was a reduction in the contribution for the following year of $177 million. And the longer term effect was a savings of an additional $6 billion in interest over the next 20 years. Here are some recent statistics of the number of agencies which have been making additional payments, additional discretionary payments to CalPERS. In the current fiscal year, we're up over $300 million in additional payments. And we estimate that, th that this additional payments, the additional payments made in this fiscal year will save these agencies over $350 million in future years in interest savings. In front of you, you can see a schedule of the amortization basis. This is actually my favorite page in the whole report. Although it may look a little imposing, it contains a lot of information about the emergence of your unfunded accrued liability. Each of the rows in this table is another layer and an another event which has happened to the plan and adds or subtracts from the unfunded accrued liability of the plan. As you can see in the, in the amortization period column, the range on, in this case ranges from seven years of the short, for, the, for the shorter basis and extends out to 30 years for the, lo for the longer basis. And we hope that you notice in the reports which are going to be issued this summer, we've actually added um, another column in there, which is going to give you even more information um, about your unfunded accrued liability and the amortization patterns. So we hope that you'll express on, uh, likes on your Facebook about this new page and the new schedule in our reports. When making a, a decision about how to make an additional discretionary payment to CalPERS, the first thing you should do is contact your actuary and initiate a discussion about what the, what the options are, what the strategies are. Basically, there are two options here or two strategies. If your aim is to develop short term savings, then you'll apply any additional discretionary payments ADPs to a short base. If you want to ach achieve longer term savings, then you'll make the contribution to a longer base. And then using a combination of ADPs, you are able to manage your contributions and develop a more stable pattern. Maybe it's time to look at a simple example. So here we've constructed a single base with a nice round $1 million balance initially. This is a long base, this is a 30 year base. And this graph shows how that base is scheduled to be amortized over 30 years. It starts initially at a million dollars and it ends up 30 years later at zero. Kurt, when I look at this UAL balance, I can see it actually increases for a short while. Why is that? Uh, that's right, Julian. So the way the amortization payments are scheduled, they start out low and gradually increase for 30 years. And when you have a 30 year base and you use that methodology, those first payments are actually so low, they're less than the interest on the balance of the UAL. So unlike a mortgage where you're paying a lot of interest at first and a little tiny bit of principal, here you're not even paying the interest, you're actually paying a negative amount of principal, and this um, phenomenon is what we call negative amortization, that initial period where the UAL is, a, is allowed to grow. So would making ADPs help mitigate this negative amortization? Uh, yes, we do see agencies that are using ADPs specifically for this reason. They look at their scheduled payment, they look at their UAL, they don't want to see it going up every year, so they make sure they make an additional payment sufficient uh, to at least cover the interest on the balance. Now what we're, we're going to do here is make an additional $100,000 ADP, additional discretionary payment towards this long base. Why would you want to apply it towards a long base? Like Julian said, maybe you're interested in long-term savings. And you can see here that it causes the balance to drop by $100,000 and it's not allowed to grow above that initial million dollars. And on the right hand side, you can see the payments towards this base. The gray line is the original scheduled payments. Uh, notice, first of all, that the scales on these two graphs are completely different. The scale on the left, we're talking about the UAL, it's a very large number. 
the scale on the right, we're just talking about the payments, much smaller numbers. Uh, the original gray line starts a little below 60,000, grows steadily for 30 years. And if you make that additional $100,000 payment, all of your future payments towards that base will be reduced. Um, in this case, they're reduced by about $6,000. But where you get the savings is when you look at the total payments. If you add up those initial 30 payments on the gray line, it's about $2.7 million. But the total payments on the orange line, including the initial $100,000 payment, extra $100,000 payment, is only $2.5 million. So you're saving about $167,000 in interest over that 30-year period. Now, in the next example, we're going to show what happens to a short base. Here, we're starting with the same balance, so we can compare. There's a million dollar balance initially, and we're going to add a $100,000 additional discretionary payment initially to drive it down further. And you can see this is being amortized very quickly. The shape of this graph is like the last, the shape of the last 10 years on the earlier graph. But what happens to the payments? Well, what happens to the payments? Um, again, it's similar but different. So when you look at the difference between the gray line and the orange line, you see that those future payments, those last nine payments are actually about $12,000 lower. So you're getting a bigger decrease in the payments. But if you add up the total payments, um, there is not quite as big of a difference. So there's only, over the long term, there's only about $40,000 interest savings. But you're applying this, in this case, to a short base in order for those short-term savings. And we measure that by that change in the contribution. So on this slide, we summarize those last few examples of numbers. The first two columns are what we did with the 30-year base. You have the initial balance is $1 million. In the second line there, we show the ADP. Uh, I'm sorry, what does that stand for again, Julian? Additional discretionary payment. Thank you. So the first column, we have no additional payment, just the original schedule with a $60,000 payment the next year in total payments. And then in the next column, we show the $100,000 additional payment. The next payment drops by 6,000, but that's not the point of this. The total payments are only 2.5 million and you're saving $167,000 over the long term. In the right two columns, we do it with a 10-year base, same balance, same initial discretionary contribution. But here you see more than $12,000 reduction in future required payments. That's the short-term savings benefit of applying it to a shorter base. Um, but the situation gets more complicated, and that's why we started with an easy example. So you don't simply have your amortization schedule with a short base and a long base, right? You have all those bases that we showed. The, the example we showed had 17 bases ranging from 7 to 30 years. And this is the way the UAL of all those bases together is scheduled to be paid down, the left-hand graph. And the right-hand graph shows the payments. And that's where we have the issue where we're showing very steep increases in the future, as recent bases are phased in and very steep decreases later on as older bases are fully amortized. What's going to happen here when we have our additional discretionary payment? So the simplest thing to do is to add a single $4 million payment. Here we have to put it on one or more of these bases. You might not have one that's $4 million. And this is what happens in this example. We drive down the UAL initially by the $4 million and it's still amortized um, over the year. You can see how the shape changes a little. You still have a period of negative amortization, um, but less so. And if you look at the annual payments, the original gray line, the original schedule that we saw earlier, and you see what happens when you make the additional $4 million payment. Now, this is a significant payment because the required payment that year was a little less than $5 million, and we made an additional payment of a little more than $4 million to bring the total to exactly $9 million. It's a significant payment. And you can see the savings. The required contribution is lower on the orange line going forward. And that very high peak um, in the future is actually slightly lower because of this additional payment. But the overall shape of the orange line isn't really all that different from the gray line. You still have steep increases in the short term, uh, followed by steep decreases later on. So what we're going to show you next is what happens if you want to take this one step farther and schedule regular payments every year in order to really manage this unfunded liability. And what we're going to do in this example is make additional discretionary payments every year so that we're contributing $9 million every year, even though the minimum requirement was below $9 million. 
So what happens in this example, you can see how the UAL is paid down and the shape is dramatically different. We've eliminated negative amortization. We're actually on a downward climb initially as we make these payments, um, but it still takes you a long time to pay it off. The real difference, the real dramatic change here is how we've changed the future payments towards this uh, unfunded liability. The same original gray line and the same first payment. Now the first payment is $9 million. It's the required payment plus an ADP, and that has the effect of driving down future required payments. But in the next year, we're also going to make an ADP. It won't be as big, but it'll be enough to bring the contribution up to $9 million. And we do that every single year. Every year, it drives the future payments down, future required payments down. And every year, for in this case, 14 years, we make an additional discretionary payment, less and less each year, to bring the total to $9 million. Now, you might say, oh, hold on a second. We might be able to make a one $9 million payment, but how can we afford to make a $9 million payment every year? And what this graph shows is that if you don't make additional payments, you will, in a very short number of years, be making required payments uh, well above $9 million, between 10 and $11 million, even higher, for a period of over a decade. So making these initial payments of $9 million might not seem like such a bad option. And this table just summarizes those examples. Again, we have uh, an initial UAL balance in all three columns. That's the same. In the first column, we have no ADP. It's just the scheduled payment of the gray line. And we see that it peaks at $11.7 million several years in the future. And the total payments are $219 million. By making one ADP initially, that pushes that maximum scheduled payment down a little bit. It's only $11.5 million. Your total payments are less, and you save $1.6 million in interest. Now, if you were to make these multiple ADPs, you're still paying down the same $104 million. You're not paying anything you weren't going to pay sooner or later anyway. You're just paying sooner rather than later. But the real benefit here is that your maximum scheduled payment um, is, never goes above $9 million rather than going to $11 and $12 million. And remember here, we're paying down the current UAL. We're not taking into account any future gains and losses that we don't know about yet. And the total payment in this last column is $209 million. So by making these earlier payments, you're actually making total payments that are less because of interest by nearly $10 million. The next method or approach to handling your unfunded accrued liability is what we call fresh starts. The idea of a fresh start is collapsing all of the bases in your tape, in your schedule of amortization into one new base and uh, selecting a period of amortization which is shorter than the average period in the table. And by doing this, you're going to have more stable contributions as well as generate interest, interest savings over the period of am amortization. If you want to think about it, the uh, bases in a amortization table are essentially all separate loans. The act of, of uh, executing a fresh start is collapsing all these loans and refinancing them all at one time. And just we want to make sure everyone is clear about this, that if you make a decision or election to start make a fresh start, this is an irrevocable decision and we won't let you unwind this um, approach. That being said, there's some other um, similar approaches which we call partial fresh starts or soft fresh starts. A partial fresh start is a situation where you look at the bases in your amortization table and again with a discussion with your actuary, you work out of the possibility of combining a number of these bases strategically in order to shorten the amortization period of them. And again, by doing that, you'll probably possibly have a slightly larger payment. However, the long-term interest savings will emerge. The other option is what we call a soft fresh start. So instead of making an irrevocable election to start, to, to, to execute a fresh start, what you do is you look at your report each year and you make an additional contribution to mimic the amount that you would, would have made under a fresh start. We'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. And as I mentioned before, you know, feel free 
to call your actuary. You feel free to call Kurt anytime to discuss the pay down of your unfunded accrued liability. Here is a copy of the page in our report which shows your current amortization schedule and also shows two fresh start alternatives. You can see here that if an agent, if this agency elected to execute a 20 year fresh start, over the entire period, they would save over $15.5 million in interest payments. If they were made a more aggressive election for fresh start for 15 years, they'd save $48 million. If you look at the in the individual payments under their current amortization schedule, this agency, as you can look on the top line, is paying about $6.3 million. If they made an election to execute a 15 year fresh start, they'd be paying $9.3 million, which is a significant extra amount. But as we mentioned before, they'd eventually end up saving over $48 million. What happens in a soft fresh start situation is you would look at this page each year, and this appears in, the, in, in your annual valuation report each year, and look at the difference between your current minimum required contribution and what the contribution would be if you executed a fresh start. And then you can call up your actuary and discuss making an additional payment, additional discretionary payment in ADP, equal to the difference between what the minimum payment is and what the scheduled payment would be if you had actually ac executed a fresh start. So this allows you to maintain a lot of flexibility in how you um, handle your unfunded accrued liability without pulling the trigger on a, um, a hard fresh start. Okay, let's look at an example, graphical example of the same thing. So here we have a UAL balance being amortized with this um, goofy uh, amortization schedule that we have. And this is how it would be amortized if we did a 20 year fresh start. So you see the shape is, is, is different, right? It slopes downward steeper and steeper until it hits zero and it takes 20 years to do it because we're doing a 20 year fresh start. But where you see the big difference is in the annual payments. Rather than having such steep inclines followed by steep declines and having that tail drag on for 30 years, uh, we have very gradual increases uh, over the entire period for 20 years. And these are calculated at a rate you'd expect an agency to be able to tolerate based on what is expected from revenue growth and whatnot. Now, you can see in this, in this example, we aren't aiming for long-term savings or short-term savings. We're simply trying to smooth out the contribution pattern. And the... Uh, issue here is those first couple years, a fresh start would mean a little bit higher payments, although for several years in the middle, they mean significantly lower payments. And the reason you would do this is if you simply want a smoother pattern of contributions. The last method we're going to discuss this morning is the use of an IRS code section 115 trust. This is a contribution stabilization fund. Some people look at it as a kind of a rainy day fund for pension, for pension plans. The assets are put into a trust, which is separate from the main trust of assets that support the liabilities at, at CalPERS. Um, from a, an accounting point of view, this, the assets in this trust would not be available to reduce your net pension liability, which is a measure that you're familiar with in GASB 68. The use of a Section 115 trust can be used to increase or decrease your investment risk. And there's a place where you can you know, put your um, um, additional contributions to be used at a future date. There is proposed legislation to allow CalPERS to have a Section 115 trust. This legislation has been sponsored by the California Special Districts Association and CalPERS supports this legislation. It would allow us to establish the California Employers Pension Prefunding Trust and would allow agencies to make a 115 contribution through CalPERS. And we would expect that using the CalPERS um, investment availability will be would have a significantly lower administration fees 
then would be charged by independent providers. Okay, so let's summarize what we've talked about here today. The first thing we talked about was making those ad hoc additional discretionary payments, or ADPs. Um, remember, we call them that because they're in addition to the minimum required contribution the employer has to make, and they're done in any amount at any time, completely at the discretion of the employer. And we talked about various strategies you might use um, when you're making these payments. Uh, we talked about making single or multiple payments, applying them to short and long-term basis in order for to achieve short or long-term savings. And we talked about um, using a series of payments in order to stabilize the contributions. The second approach we talked about was fresh starts. We discussed making an, an election to consolidate bases or collapse all the bases into one and fresh start the um, amortization of your unfunded accrued liabilities. We also briefly talked about various alternatives like a soft fresh start and partial fresh start. Again, no, please contact your actuary and have more detailed discussions about this. And finally, we briefly mentioned IRS Section 115 trusts. This is a way for an employer to accumulate funds for retirement benefits outside of the pension plan. Uh, some agencies use these in order to provide flexibility as well as manage contribution volatility and allows you to accumulate funds now and decide later uh, how much to contribute to each of your pension plans. Uh, some agencies also set up these 115 trusts because they might have a different appetite for investment risk than CalPERS does as a whole. And with that, we'll take it back to David to talk about the next steps. Outstanding. Thanks very much, Kurt and Julian. That was an excellent explanation. I really appreciate that. Uh, so as far as next steps, I think you heard pretty clearly there for, for certainly for the, the first two strategies we discussed, the additional discretionary payments and the fresh start. Really the key is to connect with your actuary here at CalPERS and really have that conversation about what makes sense for your individual agency. These are um, the strategies that really will have to take a look at the specifics of your agency and determine what would be the best course. What are your priorities? Is it you know keeping payments lower as possible or is it long-term savings? Every agency is in a little bit of a different situation with different priorities. So first step is to kind of have that conversation. Um, if you're not sure who your actuary is, or you're new to public service or you're new to your agency, um, at the end of this presentation, I'll put up an email, uh, just kind of like the generic CalPERS stakeholder relations email, shoot that inquiry to, to us and we'll get you connected with the right actuary. I also wanna put in a quick plug for our the CalPERS annual conference, which is called the Educational Forum. Uh, this is scheduled for October 22nd through 24th this year. Um, the evaluations will come out sometime in the midsummer, so the timing is nice here because you will have had a chance to look at and chew on your, your new numbers, uh, discuss with your uh, elected officials and, and kind of like come to some some conclusions or at least some, some shared questions about the valuation. And then if you can come to the educational forum, you'll have a chance to meet with any and all of our actuaries, um, hear the latest um, news about the overall performance of the fund and meet with those actuaries actuaries uh, to really hash out what's going to make best sense for you. So again, that those dates are October 22nd and 24th. Uh, it's in Palm Springs this year, so a lovely location uh, to talk about uh, actuarial sciences. Um, now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the questions that have come in. And for that, I'm going to turn the mic over to our Deputy Chief Actuary, Randy Zubek. Thanks, David, and thanks to all of our speakers for an excellent presentation this morning. I've had the easy job of just sitting back and reading all the questions that you all have been submitting, and there have been a lot of a lot of great questions. Uh, uh, since I did have an easy role at the beginning here, I'm going to ask and answer the first two questions, give our speakers a little extra time to sip some water and get ready for the more challenging questions. A couple of our listeners were interested in the year-to-date return uh, of the current fiscal year, so the year ending June 30, 2018. And I was uh, informed by text during the webinar that through the end of April, uh, we are running at 8.3% for this fiscal year, which again, like last fiscal year, is ahead of our uh, expected return. Uh, of course, uh, the June 30, 2018 valuations will use the actual return through that date. So as of now, even though things are looking really good, we don't know exactly where we'll end up by June 30, but we're hopeful we'll have two years in a row of, of positive investment performance. 
Uh, the second question was earlier in the presentation, there was a slide that showed an overall funded percent of 71% as of December 31st, 2017. And the question was, what discount rate was used to determine that funded ratio? Uh, and of course, uh, the reason for the question is that we are implementing a three-year phase down of the discount rate, as most of you probably know. It will be uh, ultimately 7%. Uh, and in fact, that 71% that we showed on the previous slide was determined uh, measuring liabilities at the ultimate 7% discount rate. So now to some of the more challenging questions and for some responses from our speakers. Um, let's see. Um, we saw an increase in the funded status recently. Was that primarily due to favorable investment return or agencies making additional contributions and closing that unfunded gap? Uh, that's a good question. So the year-to-year -year changes in um, funded ratio are driven more by investment return than anything else. The contributions themselves going into the plan right now actually don't quite cover the interest on the unfunded liability, so it's not enough to reduce the unfunded liability or improve the funded ratio, even when we add those additional discretionary payments during those years. Yeah, that I, and I concur with that answer. Julian, any? any um, yes, I agree with that. Um, some agencies have made very significant additional uh, contributions, which certainly has moved the needle with respect to their funded status ratio. But overall, um, I concur with what Kurt said. OK, great. Next question. Uh, and you guys spoke to this a little bit during the presentation, but can we clarify uh, the new amortization policy? Will that have any impact on the current unfunded liability? In other words, shortening the 30-year amortization period to 20 years, will that apply to any of the existing unfunded liability bases? No. The uh as mentioned in the introduction, the new amortization policy is for, prospect, is for prospective gains and losses which will emerge um, in the future. So the current schedule which you have in your report, and each year we do another valuation and add um, new bases, till, the, till June 30, 2019 valuation, we will not be um, showing any impact of the new amortization schedule. And when it does impact, it will only impact on future um, bases added to that table. That's right, Julian. And that's consistent with recommendations from the Conference of Consulting Actuaries and the California Actuarial Advisory Panel that say when you do change your amortization policy, it's perfectly fine to leave your existing bases alone. Let them amortize as they were originally scheduled to do. But that, be, that being said, you know, the purpose of our, this, of our webinar this morning is to recognize that there are significant interest costs in the current schedule, and we do encourage our agencies where possible to make additional um, discretionary payments or, or what, use one of the other methods in order to pay down their unfunded accrued liabilities more rapidly and achieve interest savings that way. Great. Next question. If the normal cost represents the cost of the benefits accruing in a given year, and a given agency continues to contribute that normal cost every year, why might they have seen their unfunded liability increase over the last few years? Well, that's a great question. And for that, you can turn to Julian's favorite page in the uh, actuarial evaluation. So Julian? Yes. Thank you, Kurt. Um, the, that table shows the different sources of how the unfunded accrued liability emerges. For example, when where we just did an experience study and changed some of our assumptions. So those changes in assumptions has an, has an impact on your unfunded accrued liability. Um, as we phase through the, the move to the 7% discount rate, that's also considered a change in assumptions and will have an impact on your on, on your unfunded accrued liability, and as Kurt mentioned before, the investment earnings, um, most more recently, has had a you know a positive impact on reducing unfunded accrued liability, and all those items appear in your UAL schedule in the report. Great answer. Uh, here's another question: What if an employee works for multiple Calpers agencies? So they move from one to another, and maybe a third or fourth even. Does the unfunded liability follow them from one agency to another? No, it does not. So their liability stays with the agency. So the service 
they had with each agency and the benefit they earned with that agency, they could be earning totally different benefits from different agencies, stay with that agency. Um, and then it's that agency's responsibility to fully fund it. Yes, I can cope with that. Yeah, we, we, we do. Um, there There is uh, some new um, policies that are being put in place that in some cases, uh, an, uh, an agency that hires uh, an employee from a previous agency and significantly increases their pay so that the unfunded liability from the first agency increases significantly. There may be situations where that subsequent agency will uh, acquire some additional liability as a result of granting that large pay increase. Uh, there are proposed regulations uh, for how we will administer that uh, and we will have more information on that as time goes by. Okay, uh, we talked about this a little bit too during the webinar, but uh, uh, one of our questions was w when when we see different bases in our uh, in Julian's favorite page, how was the initial amortization period determined? It was determined based on the amortization policy in effect at the time that the base appeared. So when we talk about uh, the amortization policy that we currently have, it says, well, when we have an investment gain or loss, it's going to be amortized over 30 years with a five-year ramp up and a five-year ramp down. And that's how we determine that base. And that's how all those 30 payments are determined. Yes, and you'll also notice if your if your plans are pooled plans, mm -hmm. you may have a base which is called a side fund. And those side funds were established at the time CalPERS um, made the decision to establish the pools. So we, the, make, make, to make a long story short, those side funds were established to maintain the equity of all the different plans moving into the pool. That's right. And also, we've talked about a few options you have for combining a few bases, doing a partial fresh start, a full fresh start, a soft fresh start, making additional payments, applying it to a long base or a short base. And these are just some of the options that you have. Another option you have is to look at one of your bases that's outstanding and simply shorten the amortization period. And you might see an employer do that in the case of something like a golden handshake, which originally may have been amortized over 20 years. It still may have 10 plus years left. They may think it's kind of ridiculous to be stretching out that long and they can simply shorten it down to whatever they like. Usually five years is more typical nowadays. Great, thanks guys. Uh, another question uh, from our listeners and one that I get often when I'm out speaking with agencies around the state. Uh, as I think everybody knows, or most people probably know, uh, we have we divide our plans into a couple different categories, and we refer to them as either pooled plans or non-pooled plans. Uh, the pooled plans are, are typically our smaller plans that uh, we pool together into larger risk pools, uh, and some of the experience of that pool is spread over all the plans within the pool. Uh, and the main reason for that is to limit the volatility in the required contributions from year to year from these for these smaller agencies. But can you uh, describe the process of, of uh, if an agency is pooled versus non-pooled and makes an additional discretionary contribution, what the implications are. Sure, I'll try. So and the end result is the same, whether you're pooled or non-pooled. In the case of a non-pooled plan, you know, we, we track your assets separately and the additional payment is gonna become part of your assets for your plan and it's gonna reduce your unfunded liability. Um, and we can reflect that in the amortization schedule or sometimes not simply reflect it as a as a contribution gain. Uh, with a non-pool plan, um, it's a little bit different. We explicitly track the unfunded liability. That's how we keep track of what you owe CalPERS. And the uh, additional discretionary payment has to be applied in that schedule somewhere in order for you to get credit for it. And we want you to get credit for it. We don't want the pool to benefit from this additional payment that a single agency made. We make sure only the agency benefits from it. Yes, yeah, so just to state you know, clearly, rest assured that any additional contribution that you make will be credited to your specific pension plan. However altruistic you are, we understand that these financial decisions are for your plan and they'll be credited specifically to your plan. Great, next question. Uh, this this uh, listener wants to know, is is not the amortization continuous with no end since new employees continue to join? Well, when a new employee joins, uh, they have no unfunded liability. They have no liability, in fact. And 
you from day one, you start contributing normal costs for that employee, and that's the value of the benefit they're accruing. So there's no, you know, in a perfect world, the normal cost over their career would cover the value of their benefit. When they retire, there's enough assets set aside to pay their benefit. That's the idea of intergenerational equity. The taxpayer is being charged at the time the services are being provided, and everything works out fine. It's only when events happen other than expected, so the things that can happen is when uh, the uh, actual events don't line up with the assumptions. It could be investment gain or loss. Um, it could be salaries different than expected, retirement sooner than expected. Anything that happens other than expected creates a gain or loss that changes the unfunded liability. Um, plan changes, benefit improvements or whatnot would change the unfunded liability. And as Julian said, assumption changes. When we change assumptions, there's an immediate change in the unfunded liability and the normal cost going forward. Uh, this question is is interesting. Uh, so one of our listeners wants to know if they make an additional contribution, and just after that, there's a below than expected rate of return in the investments. Does that increase the ultimate unfunded liability compared to if that agency did not make the additional contribution? Well, that's a complicated question, Randy. Um, the unfunded liability, uh, if I heard you correctly, will not be higher due to this additional contribution. What will be higher, though, is the investment loss that happened. The plan will still be better funded than it would have been. The contributions will still be lower than it would have been. But the new layer for the investment loss will be larger than it would have been. Yes, I couldn't have expressed it any better. Wow. Yes, and with that, I'm being told we are reaching the end of our one-hour time period, so I will turn it back over to What's going to happen with all these questions that haven't been answered yet, Randy? Well, we'll let David address that. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Randy. Uh, so <clears throat> for any other questions that you may have that weren't answered, if you could, um, we'll take a look at those here in the chat box. Uh, we did handle a big bulk of them. Uh, if you have any further questions, please do feel free to email this CalPERS underscore stakeholder underscore relations at calpers.ca.gov. And I and my team will get the questions to the actuaries and uh, secure a response. <clears throat> This is also the best email. If you're not sure who your assigned actuary is, go ahead and shoot an email here and we'll connect you with the right person. Um, so just a few more little housekeeping notes here. I do want to reiterate that this entire recorded webinar, not just the slides, but the actual words that were spoken, uh, has been recorded. We'll get that polished up uh, and then we'll email that out to everyone who registered, and then you'll be able to share that uh, with anybody who um, wasn't able to participate. And then we'll also have that posted and available on our website. We'll also carve out the slides um, separately so that folks can go through those. But I do want to encourage you, when you do share this with folks, um, encourage them to actually watch the webinar. The visuals are great but it's really the narrative that links them all together. So I would hate for somebody to just kind of click through the slides real fast and kind of lose um, the benefit of actually hearing um, what our actuaries had to say about the strategies. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope that this information is useful for you and for your agencies. And a special thank you to our two superstar actuaries, Kurt Schneider and Julian Robinson, for sharing their expertise. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Goodbye. <laughs>